Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk about one of the most important issues facing the world today is how do we feed an ever-growing world. Now, I'm not an academic, I'm certainly not a scientist, and I'm definitely not a politician. I am a farm boy from Bertle, Manitoba. So you're probably wondering <laughs> where the heck Bertle, Manitoba is. And if you thought it's in the middle of nowhere, you're probably right. So, first of all, I'd like to give you a perspective, a grassroots perspective of a major issue facing the world. Now, I've been lucky enough to have worked with some of the most elite farmers in the country. I've also been lucky enough to be exposed to agriculture in different parts of the world. So I hope that this will give me a perspective and be able to get, allow me to share with you what I think is a truly Canadian solution to a global pro pro problem. So, first of all, before we get started, I'd like to show you a short video. Now, some of you have may have seen this video in the past. I know the first time that I saw it, it made a huge impact to me. So, I hopefully that this will illustrate in real time the impact of global population growth. Now, I'll explain it to you a little bit. Starting from the early 1800s and moving on, each dot represents one million people. And I want you to focus on areas on the timeline and certain areas of the developing world, like India, like China. It's pretty scary, so hang on to your seats. You run the video, please. So do you believe that we're going to run out of food? Is that fact or is that fiction? I can tell you that unless we make huge changes in our productivity in agriculture, unless we start thinking about food like we think about fuel and energy, we need to start thinking about food efficiency, not so much about energy efficiency. So the UN says that we need to grow a billion more tons of cereals by the year 2050. Now, we need to do that with diminishing resources like water. The main factor that we're seeing also that we're going to have to contend with is climate change. And now, I can't speak for everyone, but a lot of people don't believe in the climate change phenomena. I can tell you from a farm boy from Bertle, Manitoba, I've, I believe agriculture has lived at the last two years. We've had incredible floods in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, the worst flooding we've seen ever. I've had people on the ground in Russia last year that lived through the worst drought in 200 years. If there's not global warming, I don't know what's happening. I want you to take a look at this graph, and this graph is provided by the UN. And if you remember the video, in the early 1800s to 1960, we saw fairly stagnant population growth. But once we look at 1960, we take a huge increase in population. And you're probably asking yourself, why? Well, it's due to a phenomenon known as the Green Revolution. Now, the Green Revolution helped agriculture production grow dramatically during that time frame. And once we increased food supply, population grew. Now, if you look at 2050, we're projected to hit 9 billion living souls. To me, that's really scary. Now, the main issue isn't just the fact that we have more mouths to feed. It's the fact that the mouths that we have to feed are getting hungrier. And what I mean by that, the middle class is growing. And if you remember the video, if you remember how the dots came in so fast in China and in India, that's where our middle class is growing dramatically. And it's not just the fact that the middle class is growing. It's the fact that we're seeing a huge change from people moving from rural areas to urban centers. 
Now, as people move from rural areas to urban centers, their incomes grow. And if you see China here as an example, you can see dramatic change in the urban population. We all know that China is an economic giant. If you look at from 2000 to 2009, we've seen incomes in the urban areas grow nearly 300%. So when people get richer, they want to eat more. And, they sh and rightly so. Not only do they, when they get richer, they want to eat more, they want to eat better. And that means more meat. So to put this into context, it takes nearly seven pounds of corn to produce one pound of beef. So if you look back today, China plans to import nine million metric tons of corn. Not a huge amount, but last year China imported only 1.3 million metric tons. And the year before that, they imported nothing. So if you look at the graph and you see how the, their population is growing, but also how fast their middle class is growing, that tells me that the middle class is eating a tremendous amount more meat. China produces 70% of the corn that China produces goes into their meat production. So, ladies and gentlemen, the middle class is going to put a huge amount of stress on our food supply. So, not only is the middle class putting stress on our food supply, when you look at our production versus our consumption, today we're almost at par. So, the issue with this is that means that our global food supplies are going down. We don't have any more wiggle room. We are one weather disaster away from a food catastrophe. And if you don't believe me, just look at last year. Russia was expected to export nearly 20 million tons of grain. They ran into the worst drought they had in nearly 200 years. I had people on the ground in Russia. I called them from the phone and said, how are things going? And the guy said to me, it's plus 44 degrees Celsius. There's so much smoke in the area, I think I've died and gone to hell. So when that happened, what we saw is food prices went up dramatically. And we've seen some commodities actually even triple in price. So what happened is, as food prices went up, places like the world, in the world, like the Middle East, became unstable. And we saw what happened in Egypt, and a lot of that started with the cost of food. So if you remember my chart about the Green Revolution, when I talked about that that was a huge change, well, during that time, the Western world increased its production 6% a year. Today, the Western world's production is less than 1% a year. And in developing nations, it's actually, their production is actually in reduction. So you hear a lot about the main factor that we're having is with our food supplies, the fact that we're running out of good arable land. And if you believe, and if you're from the Western world, you probably believe that. Every acre in Western Canada, or every acre in Canada, every acre in Europe and the United States right now is generally under agriculture production. And generally, it's fairly maxed out to the production that it can produce. We're seeing a movement to more environmentally friendly agriculture, like organics, and that's going to reduce our production capabilities. Urbanization is moving into good farmland, and that's causing some major issues. So the question again, are we running out of good land? Well, people in Wall Street certainly believe so. People like George Soros, Warren Buffett, Jim Rogers, they're pouring billions of dollars into agricultural investment projects all over the world. Uh, Jim Rogers believes that agriculture will be the next great industry. Two years ago, I was in New York and I attended one of the first agricultural investment conferences. And there was about 150 Wall Street guys looking to understand agriculture and how to figure out how to invest into it. This year, I actually was lucky enough to speak at the conference, and I spoke about technology and its implications to production. 
Today, at that conference, there was nearly 600 Wall Street investors, everybody looking and thinking about how to get into ag. So it's not just in other parts of the world where we're seeing investment. We're seeing it right here at home. We're seeing farmland prices grow dramatically in the past few years. I think you're going to see this trend continue. So I still haven't answered the question, are we running out of farmland? I want you to take a look at this map. And this map shows you all the agricultural area in the world. Now, I believe that the Western world, as we move forward, will start producing less grain for food and more grain for ethanol and biodiesel. Now, people may not agree with that, but I believe that that is where the trend is moving. So where is all the food going to come from? I believe it's going to come from three main parts of the world. The former Soviet Union, Africa, and the northern plains of China and Mongolia. Now, these places have a lot of challenges. A lack of moisture in some places, a lack of infrastructure. Corruption is rampant. But the one thing that they don't have a lack of is land. They have millions upon millions upon millions of of acres of land, and a lot of it is just sitting idle. So for me, ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe that land is the most limiting factor. I think the most limiting resource that we have is a lack of farming talent and know-how. So I'm going to move, change gears and move towards Russia. And I want to speak about Russia, because I believe that Russia is a country that's going to make the biggest impact to food production on a short-term basis. Now, Russia is fairly dear to my, my heart. I met my beautiful wife in Russia, so um, I care deeply about the country. Now, what people don't know is that in 1910, Russia controlled 36% of the world's exports. They were considered, obviously, the breadbasket of the world. By 1970... Russia was the largest importer of grain. And you're probably asking yourself, how did that happen? Well, what happened was communism. Communism went in and essentially broke down the culture of farming in those communities. And what I mean by that is that why people are good at farming, because the, that information has been passed down from generation to generation. Communism destroyed that. And it's st we still see the effects of it today. Now, when you look at Russia's landmass and you look at the distance of area that covers through the grain belt, there's 40 million hectares of land, nearly 100 million acres that sit idle. And I've been in these fields, big, huge, wide open fields with weeds chest high. So it's almost the twice the size of all the cultivated acres in Canada put together. So to put this into context, if you were to jump in your car in the summertime and drive from Winnipeg to Calgary, can you imagine not seeing one single field of wheat or barley or a beautiful yellow field of canola? It's a huge area. Now, it's not only just the idle land that can make an impact. It's the fact that Russia has over 70 million hectares of land under cultivation. So 180 million acres. Now, most of that land looks very similar to this. Now, you don't have to be an agriculturalist to understand how good that topsoil actually is. In Canada, you know, we get quite excited by having 30 centimeters of black topsoil. If you look at through the area, what they call the Black Central Soil Zone in Ukraine and Russia, there's millions upon millions of acres of land that have five feet of black topsoil. This is the best land in the world. This land has the highest productivity, and yet it grows half the amount of grain compared to a typical farm here in Western Canada. So you probably ask yourself, well, what's needed to make those changes? And you know what? There's lots of things that will make an impact. And a lot of these farms 
have a lot of these pillars that are available to them. They have good seed. They have the ability of getting good new modern day technology. They have access to precision agriculture, and Russia is probably one of the largest exporters of fertilizer in the world. So the question is, is how come they can't get it right? If you look at this, at this chart, it kind of shows you where the production is in all different regions of Russia. And if you look at the middle line, the green line, that shows you the average production in the country. Now, in 2008, you see a huge spike. I was in the country during that time, and that was essentially a bumper, bumper crop, one of the best crops they'd had in years. So what I want to show you is that red line, that's a typical production here in Manitoba. Huge difference. In Russia, they're growing 28 bushels per acre of winter wheat on the very best land in the world. So you're probably thinking about, well, what can we do about this? Well, I want to change gears a little bit. When you think about Canada and our natural resources, we probably think about oil and gas and we export that all over the world. I believe one of the greatest natural resources we have here in the country is farming talent, Canadian farming talent. Now, Canadian farmers are considered best in class. They can grow grain in the most adverse, toughest climatic conditions in the world. They're the most innovative, the most creative. The majority of the seeding implements that are used in the world come right from the majority, or right from Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Now, in other industries like mining, like oil and gas, Canadian professionals are brought in to make an impact. I think the biggest impact that we can make to the world is with agriculture. So if you take a Canadian farmer and you add him to the mix, to these pillars, you'll see huge changes in productivity. And I've seen it. In some of the areas that we work in Russia where we bring a Canadian farmer as an advisor and we put him in an area to work with Russian farmers, we've seen production over double in just a couple of years. So to me, that is what's going to make a huge impact. If you look at this, we need a billion tons of grain by 2050. If you look at the production of the, of the idle land, and we brought it up to close to Canadian standards, if we brought the cultivated land up to Canadian standards, we'd increase the food production by 300 million tons. Now, I'm not saying that's going to get us to the billion tons by 2050, but I think that we could get to that within five to ten years easily. China, the northern plains of China and Africa will have to pull their weight later. So, what I think the solution is, I think it's farmers teaching farmers. I truly think that Canadians can play a huge factor in helping the world increase their food, pro food productivity. Thank you.